Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Terry Thornton. I'm curator of education here at the Modern, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Tuesday evenings at the Modern. Tuesday evenings is a weekly um, lecture series or presentation series um, that happens each fall and each spring. And um, this has been a really interesting season. I've enjoyed it very much. Um, I'm sad to say that you know all good things have to come to an end. So next week will be the last lecture for um, the spring 2023 season. Um, but I am happy to say that Khalil Robert Irving, um, the artist who was scheduled for earlier in the season, um, is not is going to be able to make up um, the lecture that he had to miss uh, in March. So he's going to um, add um, a week to our series. So um, he is the artist that some of you may be familiar with. I hope you're familiar with who um, is holding the, that light-filled space on the second floor in the west corridor that has the kind of collaged imagery all over the walls and then the ceramics. Um, yeah, it's, um, he, yeah, he's pretty, pretty spectacular. And I have to say that um, I think that um, him being the season finale is in fact a, a really bright and beautiful way to go out. But originally, it was uh, my plan to finish the season with tonight's guest, um, opening and closing with modern curators, um, starting with Allison Hurst, um, who was here reporting on her exhibition, I'll Be Your Mirror, Art in the Digital Screen, and then the museum's most recent curatorial hire, uh, Maria Elena Ortez, who has already proven to be a very valuable addition uh, in a variety of ways, um, which I think will be evidence uh, in particular in tonight's presentation. Um, a curator and writer, Marina Elena's uh, curatorial research is informed by African diaspora, Latin American, and Latinx art histories. Um, she has collaborated um, in writing, curatorial, and speaking capacities with several prestigious organizations, including uh, the Whitney Museum in New York, uh, the National Museum of African American and, uh, Art and Culture in Washington, D.C., the um, Museum of Contemporary Art in San Juan, um, Matadero in Madrid, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona, and the Video um, Brazil in uh, Sao, uh, Sao Paulo. She has um, served as a curatorial advisor for the Horizon Art Foundation in Los Angeles. And before coming to the Modern, she was curator at the uh, Perez Art Museum in Miami, where she curated an impressive array of uh, group exhibitions and worked um, to diversify the museum's collection. In 2014, she was awarded the uh, collection Patricia Phelps de, uh, de uh, Cicinero and uh, Independent Curators International Travel Award for Central America and the Caribbean. And um, she um, received the Emerging Curator, Curator Award from uh, the Museum of Latin American Art, Long Beach, California in 2012. In um, 2024, The Modern will present Dreams of Emancipation, um, a survey that explores the history of surrealism in the Caribbean in connection, with, uh, in connection to um, Afro-surrealist and Afro-futurist art. And of course, it is curated by Marina, Maria Elena um, Ortez. With this impressive announcement and other equally important pursuits, Maria Elena has clearly demonstrated a fresh and notable perspective that is sure to serve this museum and this community very well. So if you would, please join me with a warm welcome for Maria Elena Ortez. Good evening. Thank you, Terry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, so thank you for joining. I rest a lot in terms of what I was going to share because it feels like an introduction. Um, and at the same time, typically curators, we have something up <laughs> to talk about. 
um, which I don't have that here, but I thought it's a great moment to just share with you what I see, how I see, and perhaps that way you get an insight at, at who I am as a curator. When I joined the Modern in August, so you, could, you know, I've only been here since August, one of the first tasks that I was called for was uh, our chief curator, Andrea Kern, said, hey, we're thinking about acquiring this work. Can you come and, and see it and let us know, you know, your expertise on this acquisition? I mean, I said it was Chris Ophelia. I worked in a Chris Ophelia acquisition at my previous museum, which was actually a donation. This one we were buying, which is a big deal because these are not cheap. And, um, and I saw the work and I was like, oh wow, this is uh, certainly from a very important moment in the artist's career before he won the Turner Prize, um, a, a body of work that was presented at the Tate. When you see the work, which is now on view at the galleries, which is called Strange Eyes, you're going to be you know, captivated by this image of this woman who um, looks like a black Madonna. And the surface of the work has a lot of texture, there's a lot of glitter, there's a lot of embellishment, subtle embellishment to the work, and also it's kind of you know, low to the floor. And then he also uses elephant dung, which is a direct reference to, um, of course, excrement, but how it's used in some West African uh, religions as a sign of fertility. So there were a lot of layers, multi-layers, that this work was, um, that is showing that very much resonate with, with what I like and who I am. And when I saw the work, I also saw Santeria priestesses, that even the state of Texas, you can, they exist in places like Houston, who also wear white as a, a the noteness of their, um, you know, uh, role in the religion, and also use beading as part of their practices, and the hair and the, and the, and the hairdresses are iconic aspects of that culture. And of course, I also saw the great tradition of Haitian Bebe, which artists like Milan Constant, who is about to open, actually who opened this month, uh, her first retrospective at the Fowler Museum in LA, who is a woman, which is very rare, because the Bebe are uh, Haitian flats, which here you can get a, a more, um, you know, a more uh, impact in terms of the installation. These are uh, flags that are used only in Haitian, like voodoo religion, that are mainly realized by men. And Milan is the only woman who's been doing this type of work and who's now very much embedded in the contemporary art uh, market and system. I was born and raised in the Caribbean. I'm from Puerto Rico, an island who, um, before being an American colony, was 500 years under Spanish rule. The Caribbean, if you've been there, you probably enjoy its tourist um, richness. But it's also a place that is very contested because it's in the middle of Latin America, Mexico, and the US. And during, um, you know, when, when they were dividing the Caribbean, the French, the English, the Spanish, they all were taking part, the French, in what this space was. And as you probably know, the Haitian Revolution, which is the, fa the first and only you know, successful black revolution happened in this site. And its repercussions are filled till this day. So there's a lot of, and I forgot to mention the Netherlands, the Dutch. The Dutch also have Dutch colonies in this area of the world. So it's a very, it's a place where there's a lot of intersections of identities and very, very much informs the way I still see and the type of art that I relate to or that, I, that speaks to me. After, um, before I went to Miami, I should mention that I was also a curator at the Salarte Público Siqueiros in Mexico City. I'm not going to talk about that because if not, we're going to be here for two hours and we all want to get to our next activity. But one of the first shows that I did that got the most attention was actually this work, the show by Fili Baez who now uh, is about to open her major retrospective at the ICA Boston, and she's an, who was recently at the Venus Biennale. But when I started working with Fidele, she was just an artist who her family, as a Dominican Haitian, did not want her to become an artist. And as a matter of fact, they wanted her to become a secretary, and they did not even want her to go to the studio. Because before, uh, she graduated from Hunter College and, her, um, and she moved to Miami for the show because she could get a better space in Miami. She could make big works like the ones that you see here. And her family did not want to lend her a car to, to create work. And at the time, I was like, well, this is, these people are not going to ruin my show. 
So I would wake up early to drive her to the studio so she can create work. And when we did this exhibition, she, you know, she didn't have a gallery. And a month before the show opened, suddenly all the galleries were knocking at the door, and they were, everybody was interested in knowing what was happening. And after this, um, you know, her career just just blossomed. I should mention that at that time she was mostly making paintings, and it was here where she had the idea to branch into sculpture, which initially I was very um, hesitant about because I was imagining a beautiful painting show. But then I was like, what am I? You know, I'm not the police. Like, this is the time for her to create. And after that, she started doing um, a lot more sculptural work. And she's actually about to come out with a new body of sculpture, which I'm very excited about. Just to give you an insight about the work itself, she was uh, born in the Dominican Republic, raised in Miami. Her dad is of Haitian descent. There's a lot of, for those of you who don't know, there's a lot of tension between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. A lot of it has to do with just the legacy of colonialism that spanned to, I would argue, to the Haitian Revolution when, um, you know, when, when the enslaved people rebelled, they were, um, France put an embargo on them. And, you know, I can talk about the Haitian Revolution a lot because it's a very important moment in history. It's a moment in which enslaved people were talking about liberation, about equality, about enlightenment at the same time the Americans and the French were talking about it. So they were people of their time. And, but till this day, and I won't go deep into there, there's a lot of tensions within both countries. And a lot of it has to do with race and who is a black body within that island that hosts two countries. So in Latin America and the Caribbean, there's something called, and we can call it different places in the world. Some people here call it colorism. The academic term that I often use is pigmentocracy. is this idea that within black communities, there's a hierarchy that specifically, I would argue, in Latin America has a lot to do with your phenotype in terms of not only skin tone, but also your nose, your lips, your hair. So, and specifically here. So here, in this work, she, would, she started the one uh, to our, our left. She would go into, she actually started doing this as a study in which she would start doing um, silhouettes of her portrait and look at how her hair looked every day, how curly it was, how straight it was, using as an inspiration also the brown paperback test that is more commonly known here in the US in which black communities would use it to you know, claim certain proximity to whiteness and at certain sororities or fraternities, they would determine who would enter, who would pra pra be participant of certain activities depending on if you could pass or not that test. And here she very much engages with two histories, two very absurd histories of racial testing within Latin America and also um, the American, the US, the US. Um, so that's a show in which I kind of delve deep into one artist and the artist very much kind of blossom. I've done other shows like this one in which I take on subjects that are a theme that is very welcoming, like dominoes. I grew up playing dominoes. I'm a really good domino player for anybody interesting. And, um, and I did a show about dominoes. And it was a moment in which um, I realized, wow, so many people have works about dominoes <laughs> from everywhere. So for example, here to the, to the right, right here, that's actually Donald Sultan. This is Nari Ward, this is Edra Soto, this is this Ori Murillo, this is Donald Panama. And over here, there's a work that I'll go into by Betty Saar. But this was a moment in which I could put different artists with different backgrounds in conversation with each other to create a compelling art experience. And it lent itself to, you know, again, a work like Donald Sultan that is quite formal. And when you look at it, you don't think about identity or anything like that. But then you walk into, or you ex you're encountered by this work by Betty Saar, which is a work that is actually composed on a tray, which she also takes the domino game as, um, as, a, as a motif to speak about notions of representation of identity in the America, in the US, and how, um, you know, using the image of the tar baby, the watermelon, which in the 19th century was actually uh, used uh, for, in, for people to, black people to, to sell it and to use it as to gain access to economies. And then it was re 
claim by whites actually as a symbol of stereotyping in negative ways. She looks here at the history of the stereotypical history and the problematic history of black representation in American mainstream media. Now, you know, as you can tell, and as um, Terry said in my bio, I'm very interested in the, in the African diaspora for obvious reason. Another exhibition that I did, and this was called Ally with Power, which is also at the Perez Museum, which is as African and African diaspora art from the Jorge M. Paris collection. Here, I work closely with our uh, with the main donor at PAM. He um, is a Cuban American who built first a collection of Cuban and Latin American art. And then um, he was part of the museum and eventually he, be, he gave a naming, di naming gift to the museum, becoming the first and only museum in the US with a Latin last name to it. And although he was very interested in Latin American art, he always, always collected African, uh, Afro-Latino Afro artists. And in the last five years, he's really gone really deep in the African diaspora, in African market, because if anybody here <laughs> follows the art market, the African market is booming, partly because of the rights of the African American market here in the US, but um, there's a lot of stuff uh, going in, in Africa that is quite interesting and it's, it's worth kind of looking at. Now in the show upstairs, we have a work by Elia Seaman, artist from Ethiopia, very much representative of that boom in contemporary African art. You walk into the, so this show had artists from all over um, the, the continent, but also Europe, so Afro-European artists, African-American and Afro-Latinos, kind of creating connections between the black experience, right? Because even though all these artists have different histories that are very specific to their contest, they share the history of oppression very much based on, on their race and how they're placed within colonial histories. Because as you probably know, after, um, after the America conquest, then Europe went to Africa to divide Africa into multiple colonial territories, which we'll go into in one of those work as I'll continue on. So if, as you walked in, we would have this um, really striking uh, big drawing by Kara Walker. And this drawing, she realized that when she was uh, doing a residency in Italy, so that's why you see like, a lot of motifs that very much um, allude to Western painting, right? And here, this, this work is quite emotive because um, it's very much thinking about how the, the dynamics of race in the US and how there's this constant construction and deconstruction. So that's why you see, and, and how sometimes uh, there's a structure that's being built that oppresses others. And in the back, you see a child dis destroying this, this structure. So it has a lot of layers to the work. And then to the left, it was, um, of course, our very, very Texas own Aldera Roberts. And then Adeline Bavier, um to the right, which is another great kind of Haitian American artist who creates this dream lies scape, very much inspired also by African diaspora spirituality. And then as you walk into the room, you would be encountered by this uh, striking self-portrait by Sayala Moholy. She's an artist from South Africa. She's known for doing this portrait in which she darkens her own skin, very much speaking about notions of pigmentocracy within the African and South African continent, and also about the history of photographing black bodies in the history of photography, which has its own loaded history. You see here to the, to, in her um, shoulder, there's a, a sign of a uterus, so there's also here notions of gender and femininity. Then uh, the, there's this an abstract way by Tomas Esson, an Afro-Cuban artist uh, based in Miami, and uh, Robin Road, another South African um, artist. Um, and then you'd walk into this other room where you see uh, Christopher Myers, which is known for creating this beautiful quilt. This work in particular speaks on how communities of color are often at the peril of the closest of global warming. So here you see this uh, women or uh, figures migrating, and here you see um, um, a fire. So we had all that moment of the fires in, in the West Coast and then flooding. So it's very much building on the tradition of African-American quilting to speak on um, the close-up community colors to uh, 
Moments of Peril, Jin Kayonivari, who you probably know very well because it's part of the museum's collection. Then we would stumble upon this big installation by Jonathan de Andrade, who is an artist from Brazil. Brazil, similar, very similar to the US, has a similar dynamic with uh, its black populations. So Brazil actually has the biggest black population in the, Ameri in the American continent, and by that I mean the entire South and North America. And they are also, um, they have advertised the country as a racial democracy. However, they still have a high number of incarcerated people that are black Brazilians. They also have a lot of um, uh, gun violence, police violence against black Brazilians. So they also have that same dynamic. And here, this work in particular, it was looking at um, a 1950 studies that National Geographic did in Brazil in three towns. And in that study, they, part of the conclusions were stereotypical figures of the stereotypical characters of kind of what, what Brazilians are. So here you see kind of like this angry old woman and then the hair, right? A lacy kind of like somebody reclining. The, the young females here almost like, um, not almost, very much being sexualized, right? So he took on this study to then create representations of them by real people who lived in the cities that this original uh, research paper was based to speak about notions of race and racial stereotypes in contemporary Brazil. And he uses also um, kind of this carton material because he's very much interested in advertisement and how some of the motifs that are presented in these images are still recreated today. Then, um, as you can tell, the, the collection itself was very varied. So this, this is a photography by um, Isaac Julian. And then you walked into um, other works by Maria Madera Campospon, um, another Afro-Cuban artist very much using photography to create, to deconstruct her own portrait in the work. Um, and then we also had a couple of works that dealt with abstraction, like the Donald Odili Odida, Sam Gillian. You know, this is a, a very early Sam Gillian. We know we know him for the for his draper, drapery works. But here we had a moment in which we could then think about two artists that you know, Odida. He um, is African, but is mostly in the U.S. and and very much his work is inspired by the color used in certain crafts and traditional crafts in Africa to create this hard edge abstraction. But then you can start thinking about the potential connections between him and Sam Gillian, somebody that was very much um, born and raised in the US and who also uses abstraction in his own terms. This work here is by a, a younger African artist who recently had a big show in the Art Institute in Chicago, um, Ishan Adams, and he's known for taking kind of LGBTQ plus notions to create this very much abstract quilt, merging his own um, Arab uh, Muslim background with traditional African quilting. And then we also had, you know, Sam Gil um, Stanley Whitney, who um, is, very, is actually now in the galleries here with Nicolas Lobo, another artist from Africa, and then Guido Niñas. And I was always very interested in, in this types of relationship because Guido Niñas, he's actually one of the, he's a Cuban artist that is known as one of the eight artists that brought abstraction into Havana. And Havana, Havana is, you know, it was the Paris of the Caribbean. Um, it was, if you ever go, I mean, it's, it's, it's just very striking. So in the 40s, 50s, 30s, they were 20s, they were very advanced in terms of modern art. And he's an artist that is very much thinking about the square, the grid, color, right? Uh, mark making 20, 30 years before Stanley Whitney, who's also thinking about the grid, who's also thinking about color. And I, I find it, when, when you start, even though again, they're from different countries, different histories, but when you put that together, then you can start thinking more globally about what an international study about modern black abstraction can be added into the, the, the mainstream canon, right? 
Now, the museum, kind of going back into the beacons like Celia Sanchez and Carmen Herrera, the museum had a very strong um, Caribbean art collection. And we were pioneers in collecting some work, like, you know, this is millions of dollars now. You can, it's hard to get one because she's dead. Carmen Herrera, um, who had her first, she was working alongside Donald Judd and all these, you know, beacons of American minimalism. But she was ignored. She wasn't part of that, of that club. And she created work. And it wasn't until she was 103 that she has her first solo show at the Whitney Museum. And there were cases like Carmen Herrera or Celia Sanchez, another artist who's um, Cuban based in Puerto Rico, who was also creating work their entire careers. And now people are looking at their work really late. So we were very much. Um, very interested in not following that trend and being the ones that were kind of leading the conversation in terms of the types of artists that we wanted to support, hence going back to Philly Bias, right? And as part of that, because we felt in Miami that we were at the gateway of Latin America, we had a big Caribbean population that was very diverse. It was not only Cuban American, it was also Haitian, Puerto Rican, and that was, you know, coupled with Colombians, Venezuelans, and so on, Bahamians, Jamaican. We um, decided to, very in very self-awareness, we decided to do a lot of exhibitions with books, because I think that's also important, with books and programs that dealt with the Caribbean. And then, um, so I did some of the shows, not all of them. This was something that the curatorial team did together, led by Tobias Ostrander at the time, the chief curator. And then we decided to go to the Mellon Foundation and ask them for a million dollars. So I wrote the grant to get the money. We got the money and we started what we called the Caribbean Cultural Institute, which is still um, an initiative that happens till this day. And through this initiative, what we wanted to do was because this type of work is not necessarily what people are funding all the time. And even when we were in Miami, it was hard to fund this project. You know, complete honesty, it was hard because people expect to see Rauschenberg, they expect to see Warhol, they expect to see all the people that we see all the time. <laughs> and um, we wanted to get support for this for these programs, so we ended up. Um, submitting a grant to get the, the work. I should stop here and just kind of mention, this is uh, an exhibition that I curated by Patricia Diego Munoz, who is a video artist who's been working in San Juan for a long time. Um, this video here um, is a video in which she creates, it's called, I believe it's called The Spell, or I didn't do The Spell, and it's about a woman that you see here that if you know um, the duo La Jeta Se Nono, who were part of the Whitney Biennial a couple of years ago, that's, this, is one of, um, uh, this is one of them. And it's a, a, a video that speaks about the stereotypes of Caribbean black women as people see them as witches and kind of like, I don't know. Of uh, be wishing characters, and so she's trying to cast a spell, but she's listening to punk music, and she's like kind of doing this other stuff that is non-stereotypical, right? Now, going back to the CCI, uh, we decided to then use this money to keep supporting exhibitions, but also support new research. So we commissioned a series of scholars that would work with our collection. Uh, so this is um, Erica James here. That she, she she proposed a project, and we would fund the research and publish the essays and her research on our website. And it was really important to do this because a lot of this work would sometimes, even though we have good Caribbean holdings, we the research for it is not as vast. So by inviting others to create research to the collection, then we would have content for when I wasn't there anymore or other curators were not there anymore, the curators that would come in would have something that they can use to then continue making exhibitions. We also uh, would do a lot of uh, programming, and this is particular education, uh, high education. So Tilting Access was a program in which we would invite different curators, museum directors, people that uh, would have art spaces in the Caribbean, 
not only in the Caribbean, but also in the diaspora, to gather once a year. This time was in Miami, other times were in different parts of the Caribbean, to exchange ideas. Because sometimes when you're doing this type of work, you're kind of doing it alone at times. And you need somebody to talk to, to really think about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it together. Because that's really how you create more impact as a collective. So it was a very um, fruitful exchange. And as a matter of fact, I ended up doing an ex coherent exhibition uh, with Marsha Pierce here as part of these exchanges um, that took place. And also, it was a great time to then also invite people. Like, we invited, uh, for example, Tanya Barson when she was at Tate. We invited her to come so then she would see the artists that we were want to, to work with, or we invited um, uh, people from Video Brazil that would come in and then see the type of work that we were doing to, uh, to create different types of, of, of exchanges and potential collaboration, not only for us, for us, but also people that were participating. We also supported, um, we also supported artists, so we did uh, residencies in which we would, artists would apply and we would give them money to create, create work. So this is purely production of funds. This is an artist named Eliezer Ortiz based in the Dominican Republic. He is known for creating these large care drawings in which he combines or he references how uh, the Taino communities in the Dominican Republic started um, mixing with the enslaved people and then the Dominican Republic creating their own communities. So that's what he's depicting here, kind of like this new, um, this new group of communities that are very much, um, have a lot of layers within their culture, right? We also uh, did performances. So this is Nugent Smith and, and Marvin Fabien. And this was a way also to create connections with the outdoors, because in Miami, the outdoors was our biggest competitor. It's, it, it's free to go to the beach, and it's expensive to go to a museum. So this was a way in which we take the museum outside, the, the, outside of its walls to engage with the people. Another um, uh, big part of my job there, or my career, <laughs> right, has been working with acquisitions. And going back to this um, idea of really looking at artists at the right time, which a lot of it had to do with the fact that at my previous museum, we would have to raise funds to acquire works. So we really, you know, I became an expert, and I still am an expert, <laughs> on looking at artists and saying, OK, you are going to make it. One of those artists was Maria Berrio. And we acquired this work through our collector's council you know, in 2019. Now you can barely get one. <laughs> Um, I'm sure we're going to get one for this museum, but I just don't know the date. Um, uh, and then also, you know, before Cecilia Vicuña had her, um, her big show at the Guggenheim, uh, I believe it was like two years ago, um, I worked in this acquisition to acquire this big kibbutz gut, which her work is very much inspired by the traditions of the kipu and the Inca. The kipu is this... During the you know, Inca times, they used to use this, this thread and knot as, a, as language. So that's what it was being used people to communicate. And she takes that to speak about soft sculpture, of course, abstraction, of course, but also um, female work as, as textile. And this almost you know, looks like, almost like a string of blood in a, blood in a way. So there's a lot of layers to to this work, but we were able to, and this show, this actually is an installation we from Documenta. So um, this is another kind of kind of work, or artists like Conrad Eggier, who, you know, this is another one that I believe we got this when it was like $10,000. I mean, I'm, I think our sister is flying now, over thousand, you know, like things that, really looking at artists that are doing something very compelling and something very, much of the time right now and, and why they're, they're important. And another more, most recent acquisition was this work by Bonnie Ramirez. And this to say, you know, it wasn't always easy to push this work through our collector's council or through our acquisitions committee. We had to believe in it really strongly. We had to argue for it. And we got to get somebody really excited. And with this work, when I presented this work, I really didn't think they were going to vote for it, because we had this group 
called the Palace Collectors Council. And I, I, I wasn't 100% sure because he's really young. He's also, um, he's not, he doesn't come from a traditional art background, but you know, at the same time, he's making work that is very exciting. And the, vote, the group didn't vote for it, but then two of our patrons, Jorge Perez and Craig Robbins, they put in money to buy it and we bought it. And at the end of this meeting, one of the donors that uh, voted for it but didn't put money to buy it came to me and told me, you know, you really, you should, you really change our perspective on, on how we look at art. Ten years ago, five years ago, this would never have happened. So just to speak about how just engagement, education, exposing people to new ideas, like how that, it, it takes time, but, there's all, but you're making an impact, even if you don't see it right away. Now, I thought I was going to speak for, 40, for 45 minutes, but it's been actually a little bit less. And I wanted to end in this image because... She and I came to the museum at the same time. You know, she's going to be here forever. I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not going to survive forever, unfortunately. But I'm very hopeful about what each of us can leave behind in this museum. Thank you. <laughs> So I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments or, sure. Similarly to the CCI, are you thinking about any new initiatives or programs at the Modern that you can share with us? Yes, we have been working to, um, to, to create an initiative that makes sense to the museum. Um, you know, we're knocking on doors to see who would support it. Um, and I don't want to share too much unless you know, you know somebody that can fund, and then we can meet on the side, and you know. <laughs> but um, but yes, I mean, I think that what's exciting about the modern, aside from this beautiful building and the beautiful exhibition history that it has, is so the potential for growth. That's something that um, it's very exciting. Yes, I just read a book, and it eluded a little bit about some of the politics of uh, acquiring shows and and dealing with the artist and uh, so forth. Have you encountered the politics of acquiring art and shows and dealing with uh, the egos of the artist and when you install the works and so forth? Of course. I mean, I think curators are like Carl Selsmans that are also really good politicians. Um, uh, but definitely, I mean, I wouldn't talk to them publicly. I mean, I did a show at Pam that the artists wanted to create a fire in the museum and, at the roof. And at first I was really nervous, but then I realized that all the men were super into it. So the director was into it, the CFO was into it. The, the, so I was like, okay, so we ended up doing it. Um, uh, so it was easier to navigate, but yeah, definitely. Um, and there's a lot of, like any industry, there, there's a lot of egos involved and there's a lot of different interests involved, especially in museums. So you just, you know, the more you do it, the more you become better at it and the more you learn how to set boundaries and to make sure that, which is my thing, I just want to make sure that we both have the same expectation and we're clear on what my expectations are and what yours are. So that way when there's miscommunication, we can go back and make sure, you know, I told you that and you told me that. And it's on the email. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. That was very helpful to understand your interests and very educational, frankly, because it's not an area that I'm familiar with, frankly. So, and I, I own Latin American art, so I'm not familiar with that type of art. But thank you for that. So thanks for sharing. You're welcome. One of the things that uh, you know I found surprising about your what you described this isn't surprising you because you lived it actually. But you know when I think of Miami, I think of a city that is. You know, the pushing the boundaries of all sorts of ethnicities and cultures. And I was surprised to hear, and I'm not, this isn't a question, this is, I'm just saying, making a comment, I guess, but uh, I was surprised to hear that they wanted to see the same art that most of the museums want to see, like at, the, like at MoMA or something like yes. that. Yes. I mean, really? Is that what they want to see in Miami? I mean, this, there's no melting pot in this city, in this country, like Miami, actually. And I'm surprised the patrons didn't have a broader view of art than the people at MoMA do, for example. Well, I think that a couple of things. First, um, museum boards are very similar. Uh, 
and, and you know, for better or worse, you could have a diverse population, like the same here in Texas, which is very diverse, but it doesn't mean that the funders are very diverse. So, so part of our job is to try to attract people that have the means that will support this type of work, which is hard because also in, you know, you could first think, oh, I'm just going to try to get a donor of color like Jorge Perez. That's rare. That's rare because in communities of color, often they haven't had access to museums. I didn't know what I mean. Like, I, I never thought I'd become a curator. I, it just happened when I was in my 20s. And when I told my parents, they were like, hell to the no. You have to do something that makes money. So, like, you know, it, it's, it's very uh, complex in terms of that. But that's why we do need to create more education, you know, diversify our, our thinking, think creatively of, of museum boards and um, what their role are. Uh, along with funders, I think Mellon and Ford and other foundations have done a lot of great work on that regard. But, um, but yeah, but yeah. Hi. I am so happy that you're in Fort Worth. You know that. Can you talk about the role that travel plays in your curatorial and your creative practice? Um, the eye has to travel. So how did you develop the way that you see? So um, tra I travel a lot, as you know, <laughs> and um, it's important to travel because I think that more that it, I grew up in an island, so I grew up wanting to escape the island because there was nothing else to see. And the more you see, really the more you know about yourself. And the more that you can exchange ideas, you know what's happening, you know what shows are coming up, you can exchange ideas with colleagues. And, um, and the more you kind of expand your way of thinking in terms of what art can be. Nowadays with Instagram and Zoom, you know, and all that, I think there's ways to mitigate it a little bit. Because I, I don't think, every, you know, not everybody has a personality to like leave. And, and travel is very taxing on your body. Um, but I think it's important and I, I it's like my chocolate. Like I hate it and love it at the same time, you know. <laughs> but I think I love chocolate more. So, so, but but it's it's very important if you don't, you know. And also to diversify your travel. Like, for better or worse, I was never like a New York fiend. I probably because in Puerto Rico there's like a big uh, New York Puerto Rican population in New York, so people always wanted to go to New York. And I've never I went to work in Mexico City, and I never had that inkling to go work in New York City. Who knows, maybe I will in the future um, if they offer me an amazing salary and job. <laughs> All this to say that, um, that it's also important to just not just only go to New York, like, you know, go to different places, like really think about the world in a more expansive way. Because right now we're not, we're not in the 80s or where, where there was Paris, New York, and that's it. Like now the art market is everywhere. You know, when I spoke earlier about the African market, you know, there's like a big bunch of galleries in South Africa, in Cape Town. And, and you can really, as a collector, you can really delve into, and as a curator, delve into all these different markets. Maybe I cannot buy a David Hammonds, of course not, because it's millions of dollars, but I can find an amazing work of art in Mexico City. You know, and those, so, so I think that it's also, um, you have to really think creatively and look beyond. Uh, I know we spoke a little bit about your uh, upcoming exhibition here, but what other types of ex exhibitions can we expect to see from you in the future? Um, you know, um, that's a good question. I'm taking it like three, four years at a time. Mm -hmm. And again, I feel like the last time I shared my idea with somebody, then I feel like even Cecilia Le Manis told it. You know, like, so I'm very, very guarded about what I'd share in terms of ideas. Um, you talked earlier about kind of having your, like, your finger on the pulse for new acquisitions, new artists. So I guess, I don't know if you want to like spill any trade secrets, but how did you kind of like hone that understanding or like what makes like an artist stand out to you? Well, part of it, you know, traveling is a big one, but also 
also seeing what people are doing and also be like knowing the system. And what I mean by that, you know, there's museums, there's art spaces, there's galleries. There's also, um, um, I guess, art cities, you would call it. But for example, Yale. By now, we all know that Yale is always going to come out with a couple of artists that are going to be great and that they're going to get a studio museum residency. So knowing who's in the program, knowing where, knowing where those artists are showing, like just becoming uh, uh, very, very astute about what the system is and, and how it moves. So seeing who's supporting, I mean, Teresita Fernandez once told me this, which I think is a very true statement. Like once a collector, a certain type of collector buys the work, they're going to want to protect it. So they're going to tell their friends to buy it. And then, you know, that artist certainly has this, um, uh, um, he's safe, right? Or he's, he's, he's going in a trajectory. Also, you know, as curators and as museums, we also have a lot of power in this whole conversation. So once you're in an institution and you see an artist that you feel like, you know, you see the trajectory, you see the story, you feel like it's going somewhere, then creating scholarships. So for example, um, my, ne my next show here is an artist by Jamie Holmes. He's based in Dallas. I'm sure a lot of you know him. He's heavily collected. So he's at the DMA collection. He's at the museum in um, Oklahoma. He's at the ICA in Miami. His work was recently acquired at PAM. He's in a bunch of private collections, not only in the state, but also internationally. And he has never had a museum exhibition. So I'm like, oh, wow, this, this doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, this, he's an artist that's being obviously validated by public institutions, by private collectors. He needs the contextualization from a museum. And I think that's also, within the story, I think, you know, I'm, I'm talking from a privileged position in terms that I'm inside the institution, but, um, but museums, instead of validating artists and instead of supporting artists, plays a key role within the story. That's why it's so important for us to expand on history, some modern and contemporary art and so on, because we are also influencers in this whole in this whole um, system. That's how you get the board to acquire what you want. Right there. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that wonderful summary of your past accomplishments. Um, and I was I was really curious to see how you see how that trajectory continuing here at your time at the Modern and in Fort Worth, especially sort of with an interest in your very profound community engagement and engaging with um, the populations that make up the city of Miami and I'm curious to how you see that that for well. Well, you know, I find out. And, but I'm hopeful, like I went to a Theaster Gates event in, um, on Friday at the Nasher, thanks to John and them. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so it was my home and we did start to come in and you have to build it. And you really have to uh, be mindful and be thoughtful. So I'm learning, I, I had a really, when I, when I joined the museum, I participated in a racial equity cohort, which was just good for me just to learn the history of the city. And I think that um, for better or worse, there are a lot of stereotypes about the city that have come to be um, not true. Like I think, you know, when you mentioned earlier about Miami being this kind of cultural hub, the US is, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, all alleged, um, the U.S. is very similar. You just have different degradations of, of opinions, but all cities are, I mean, there's a reason why it's just one country. So, so and, and all cities look the same. Like, they look, I mean, they're, they, they look very diverse. Like, I, like here in Fort Worth, what, is it like 35% Hispanic, then another, what, 15% Black? Um, so that means I'm the majority because I'm black and Latin, you know what I mean? So, so you know, I, I think that um, there's a lot to do and, I'm, and it seems like the audience is interested. And I think that you also have to just try because again, when, when we started doing this stuff at my previous institution, it was, it was a struggle until this, I mean, till this day. I'm sh that's why we got a grant to support it. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about your experience of uh, visiting our studios? Do you, I've been impressed that you've been so proactive with that since you've been here, and maybe speaking to that a little bit, that experience. Yeah, I mean, it's very important to visit artists because they, um, they know, they know the streets. So, and not only they know that, but also they lead you to good artists. So some of the best artists that I've worked with has been because an artist recommended it to me. So, and, and, they, and, they, and you also get a sense of the pulse of things. So, and quite frankly, a lot of the artists that I've visited here in the DFW area, they're all very happy, which makes you feel very hopeful about the city. It, it feels like probably there's more opportunities that can be given to, to local artists, but not only from museum, but just from different entities, because it's not just museum led. Right, um, but yeah, no, I, I've been visiting studios, going to Dallas, and, um, and trying to get to know who I need to know, and making myself available too, yeah. And um, I want to tell you how I'm excited as a long-term member of the modern, we see your being here and seeing the examples of your previous work. But I'm also curious, knowing who, you, who you've dealt with and the, your areas of expertise in terms of location, where is intersection of the African, um, the African and Hispanic? Here and here? Here and even in your practice. In my practice, um, uh, well, um, I am I am black and I'm also Latina, so certainly that informs the way I <laughs> get things together. Um, that being said, I, I just got here to Texas, so I'm still learning, right, and still kind of getting understanding the context. I think that, in my impression, is that at least this area, like the Texas is very diverse. It's very diverse. Like it, the powers that be might not be, which is very common. It's very common, you know, in most American cities, but um, it's, very, it's very diverse. And I, you know, I, I cannot claim to be an expert on Texas because I just got here. Mm -hmm. but, um, but those are questions that I'm working through. more so fun, which is rare for me. Um, but I know like a lot of curators and exhibitions have like playlists and like with your lens and the way that you um, see art and collect art is so um, varied. I wanted to know like about your music list, um, what you're listening to and what you picked up from the places you visit, like even styles of music, you don't have to go so specific. But also um, reading set in your your work and how you curate. Well, this is not a surprise. Right now, I'm listening to a lot of reggaeton, um, uh, <laughs> and um, I was just in Puerto Rico, and a friend introduced me to this um, artist called um, Villana Antillana, which is like this. Um, I think she's a drag queen that, that does reggaeton. <laughs> yeah, you all know it. I I know it. Um, I also listen to a lot of podcasts. I really like podcasts on psychology. Like <laughs> I listen to Hidden Brain. Um, um, I also I watch a lot of trash on reality TV, I'm not gonna lie, and a lot of YouTube on that, and, um, and what else? Um, I think that's what I'm kind of doing now with my consumption um, of culture, yeah, I think so. Do you have time to read outside of your research? I try to, like I, I, I try to, you know, especially in Spanish because that's like my first language so I try to um, read its literature in Spanish as much as I, as much as I can. Um, yeah, I try to. Yeah. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a new member here and I've only recently started going more and more to art museums to get better, find out what art looks like. So I guess I'm curious, you have been to a lot more, you've been with a lot of institutions, frankly. 
so the, other than what your the observations you've already shared, um, how do, what can you share? I mean, you shared observations about how you know the communities are diverse everywhere, and the boards tend not to be diverse everywhere, and that. Uh, uh, this is a beautiful building. Any other observations in your first eight months here that you want to share about this museum relative to other institutions that you've been associated with? You don't have to be specific, but I'm just anything else other than the things I, I mentioned. Good question. Well, um, um, if I can be very honest. Yes, please. <laughs> with my boss in the audience. <laughs> um, I think this museum, it feels to me and I could all allege, I could be wrong, that is that a moment where, is that a turning point? So it either creates drastic changes or it doesn't. And I think that change, we all want change, we all want to get in a diet and do this other stuff, but change is hard. Change is hard. So we'll see. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sorry. Yeah. That's a good observation. Thank you. You're welcome. So the last question. I'll do the last question. Good. Well, look, the last question would be one that I'm kind of dangling. It's a super half-baked uh, question. Yeah. But so I'm a physician, and I recently left uh, clinical practice and academic medicine to move into the architecture and design space. Good for you. Yes, and it, I'm kind of creating a lane. One of the things that, I, and even throughout your presentation, I found myself kind of resigning my thoughts to is the intersection of art and healing. And um, I keep, you know, I'm, I'm at a place where I'm now privileged to design big hospitals with firms to do really everything, how we actually heal patients, if that makes sense. And I keep toying with art and, and, and how we now move art into the spaces of meetings and ways. So I'm, I'm tossing that to you to say, tell me your thoughts on that. That's a very fertile ground. Um, as a matter of fact, my older sister's previous boss, she worked in Chicago for a little bit. I like to think that I got her that job because he was an art collector and he told her who her sister was and um, uh, she got the job. <laughs> and every so often I see him in art fairs. So, and he buys works, he's also a physician, my sister's a physician, and um, he buys work for hospitals, and he works with artists to, to, to create work. So it depends how, even, and we can talk offline, but it also depends how you want to approach it. You can just buy art that you like, which could help emerging artists, or you know, you can also think about artist investment, but knowing that that is like any investment that you make, you can lose all your money. <laughs> Um, uh, so, but, but yeah, that's certainly, that's, that's a thing. And in Miami, actually, there was this collector, a dentist, who collected a lot of Miami local artists, and he would do shows at his dental office. So, and there's a lot of artists that are into art and healing, like Simone Lee, who just had her big retrospective open at, um, at the ICA Boston. So it's, it's a whole uh, body of work. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>